G'day Poetry Geeks, I'm Jackson and you are watching The Poetry Show and in this Poetry Show we are going to be reading and talking about the classic Australian bush poem The Man from Snowy River. Okay, so we're discussing this poem today because it was a request from uh, Paul O'Mahony. If you don't know Paul O'Mahony from uh, Periscope in particular and Twitter and WordPress and he's all over the internet he is a social international superstar. Uh, then please check out his, uh, his periscopes are live uh, pretty much every day on Walt Whitman and they're fantastic broadcasts and everybody should check them out. And you can also catch up with him via Twitter as I said before. So I'll leave a link to that in the more information down below so you can keep up with Paul. But this is a, a special video dedicated to Paul because I've started my own periscope journey going through an anthology of Australian poetry and it just so happens that this poem, this quintessentially Australian poem, is not in the anthology. Uh, there is a Banjo Patterson poem, but not this particular one. So I wanted to make a special video uh, just for this poem and just to give it uh, a place of honour on my YouTube channel. Um, it's a, a little bit of a long poem, so I'm gonna, uh, I'll am gonna i read through it in, in one go and then we'll have a bit of discussion towards the end. And you'll have to excuse me as well because I am reading this from my computer screen uh, because I don't have a paper copy of this particular poem. And that means my eye line is going to be slightly off. So if you find that disconcerting, uh, then you can close your eyes and listen to me read instead. Okay, so this is The Man from Snowy River by Banjo Patterson. There was movement at the station, for the word had passed around that the colt from old regret had got away, and had joined the wild bush horses. It was worth a thousand pound, so all the cracks had gathered to the thray. All the tried and noted riders from the stations near and far had mustered at the homestead overnight. For the bushmen love hard riding where the wild bush horses are, and the stock horse snuffs the battle with delight. There was Harrison, who made his pile when Pardon won the cup, the old man with his hair as white as snow. But few could ride beside him when his blood was fairly up. He would go wherever horse and man could go. And Clancy of the Overflow came down to lend a hand. No better horseman ever held the reins, for never horse could throw him while the saddle girths would stand. He learnt to ride while droving on the plains. And one was there, a stripling on a small and weedy beast. He was something like a racehorse undersized, with a touch of Timor pony, three parts thoroughbred at least, and such as are by mountain horsemen prized. He was hard and tough and wiry, just the sort that won't say die. There was courage in his quick, impatient tread, and he bore the badgered gameness in his bright and fiery eye and the proud and lofty carriage of his head. But still so slight and weedy, one would doubt his power to stay. And the old man said, that horse will never do for a long and tiring gallop. Lad, you better stop away. Those hills are far too rough for such as you. So he waited, sad and wistful. Only Clancy stood his friend. I think we ought to let him come, he said. I'll warrant he'll be with us when he's wanted at the end, for both his horse and he are mountain bred. He howls from Snowy River, up by Kosciuszko's side, where the hills are twice as steep and twice as rough, where a horse's hoofs strike firelight from flintstones every stride, the man that holds his own is good enough. And the snowy river riders on the mountains make their home, where the river runs those giant hills between. I have seen full many horsemen since I first commenced to roam, but nowhere yet such horsemen have I seen. So he went. They found the horses by the big mimosa clump. They raced away towards the mountain's brow, and the old man gave his orders. Boys, go at them from the jump. No use to try for fancy riding now. And Clancy, you must wheel them. Try to wheel them to the right. Ride boldly, lad and never fear the spills, for never yet was rider that could keep the mob in sight if once they gained the shelter of those hills. So Clancy rode to wheel them. He was racing on the wing where the best and boldest riders take their place, 
and he raced his stock horse past them and he made the ranges ring with the stock whip as he met them face to face. Then they halted for a moment while he swung the dreaded lash, but they saw the well-loved mountain full in view and they charged beneath the stock whip with a sharp and sudden dash and off into the mountain scrub they flew. Then fast the horsemen followed, where the gorges, deep and black, resounded to the thunder of their tread. And the stock whips woke the echoes, and they fiercely answered back from cliffs and crags that beetled overhead. And upward, ever upward, the wild horses held their way, where mountain ash and courage on grew wide. And the old man muttered fiercely, We may bid the mob good day, no man can hold them down the other side. When they reached the mountain summit, even Clancy took a pull. It well might make the boldest hold their breath. The wild hop scrub grew thickly, and the hidden ground was full of wombat holes, and any slip was death. But the man from Snowy River let the pony have his head, and he swung his stock whip round and gave a cheer, and he raced down the mountain like a torrent down its bed, while the others stood and watched in very fear. He sent the flint stones flying, but the pony kept his feet. He cleared the fallen timber in his stride, and the man from Snowy River never shifted in his seat. It was grand to see the mountain horsemen ride. Through the stringy barks and saplings, on the rough and broken ground, down the hillside at a racing pace he went, and he never drew the bridle till he landed safe and sound at the bottom of that terrible descent. And the watchers on the mountain standing mute saw him ply the stock whip fiercely. He was right among them still as he raced across the clearing in pursuit. Then they lost him for a moment, where the two mountain gullies met. In the ranges but a final glimpse reveals, on a dim and distant hillside, the wild horses racing yet, with the man from Snowy River at their heels. And he ran them single-handed till their sides were white with foam. He followed like a bloodhound on their track, till they halted, cowed and beaten. Then he turned their heads for home, and alone and unassisted brought them back. But his hardy mountain pony, he could scarcely raise a trot. He was blood from hip to shoulder from the spur. But his pluck was still undaunted, and his courage fiery hot, for never yet was mountain horse a cur. And down by Kosciuszko, where the pine-clad ridges raise, their torn and rugged battlements on high, where the air is clear as crystal and the white stars fairly blaze at midnight in the cold and frosty sky. And where around the overflow the reed beds sweep and sway to the breezes and the rolling plains are wide, the man from Snowy River is a household word today, and the stockmen tell the story of his ride. Now, in reading this, I realise I made a mistake, because I am recording in a room where there is a washing machine going. So I'm going to move, and hopefully it's not too distracting. Okay, there we go, a little bit more comfortable, and um, there'll probably be all sorts of inconsistencies with the audio and the white balance and all sorts of things, but this is not a professional show, so we can handle it. Uh, one of the things I thought I should say very quickly, if you have trouble kind of following the poem and the narrative of the poem, um, because it's a little bit long and you're hearing it, so you might not, you know, not seeing it written down, it might be a bit hard to follow. The basic narrative of this poem is that, uh, quite simply, uh, the cult from old regret had got away. So a horse has basically bolted. And um, this is an expensive horse. It's, um, I think they say it's worth a thousand pound. This is worth worth a thousand pound back in uh, the 1800s, uh, mid 1800s. So this is going to obviously be a very expensive horse. And we get the idea that um, all of the men, all of the the greatest, most renowned riders from uh, the Australian bush, come to the place where the horse is bolted and they're all going to go and try and capture this horse because this is an important thing this is like you know the community coming together to try and you know solve a crisis um, and one of the men who arrives uh, well one of the men who arrives is clancy from the overflow who's the you know 
incredible renowned rider who we trust and he's he's going to be doing the main part of the job but then also this scrawny guy rocks up on a, a horse which um is a well-respected kind of breed of horse like the men recognize that this is a good horse but they don't they don't fancy the man much they think he's um he's too scrawny and he's not gonna he and his horse are not going to be able to see this through to the end but it's clancy from the overflow uh, overflow the experienced rider the one whom we are kind of told to trust who says no you've got to give this guy a go because he's from snowy river and they breed him different up there um so we get this lovely description of what it's like to be the man from snowy river and that's where uh, the you know the the hooves strike firelight from the flintstones every stride that line comes in um, so the fact that he's from Snowy River is credentials enough and you know true to Clancy's word when every other horse has fallen by the wayside when the horses make it to the ridge that the uh, the captain said you know once the horses get to that point there's no saving them they get to that point they get past that point and the only man on the tail the one who's kind of come up the rear of course is the man from Snowy River uh, the man from Snowy River is a man whose name we never learn it says you know he becomes a household name but we don't know his name he's just the man from snowy river um so he and then we get this wonderful um description of the chase and the, the the dreadful descent that he goes down and he's jumping logs and he's he stays with the the horse and he manages to turn him around and he brings him back and he's a hero and he says you know uh, the horse was kind of wearied and bloodied but it was a brave horse and it would see him through to the end as well and then he's become uh, a a household name as a response and that people even today still sing the songs and still tell the story of the man from snowy river and we know that's true because because i am uh, so yeah so look i'm really glad that um paul got me to read this poem because i've been working my way through some early bush poets um in the anthology that i'm looking at on periscope at the moment and within these poems there is this they, they all seem to rely on this ballad form and they all have a very kind of strict meter and there's a lot of rhythm to them and they rhyme and there's a very kind of um, very simple kind of balladeer musical quality to them so i i think on the one hand it's tempting to think that that's purely because these um, australian bush poets at the time are mimicking the type of poetry that they were used to um, and the type of folk traditions they were used to um, you know back in their home countries you know back in England and Ireland and that kind of thing but um, and I think that that's true to, to some extent but as you read this poem in particular I think you probably get the sense that um, this is a this is a story that's being told about these runaway wild horses and these, well, not necessarily wild horses, but, you know, there are wild horses in the poem, but there are runaway horses, and there are horses that are being ridden by these um, stock riders who are trying to, you know, re recapture a particular horse that has got away. And um, so there's this galloping, there's all this galloping in the in the poem. It's, it's a very kind of active, really heavy, active, hard riding of these men. And that reminds me of the poem charge of the light brigade by tennyson half a league half a league half a league onward all in the valley of death rode the 600 forward the light brigade charge for the guns he said into the valley of death rode the 600 and um, so this is a quick bit of tennyson there and the thing i like about the the tennyson poem is the the meter of that the rhythm of that that it mimics the the charge of the light brigade of the horse's hooves and the same can be said of this particular poem the man from snowy river there was movement at the station for the word had passed around that the cult from cold regret had got away it's -da 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 -da. you know it's it's got that movement to it um and then i was thinking back i was like well maybe this is just this is the metrical pattern that fits ballads so it makes sense that you know australian poetry has that in it so there, there is just, it's driven by the form, driven, if you can excuse the pun, um, it's driven by the form, but then all of the poems I've read so far in this Australian anthology and in this one as well, um, The Man from Snowy River, also include horses. So the content of the poems is discussing the, the life of 
these Australian bush poets and, and their common experiences. And one of their common experiences is the riding of horses. So maybe I'd like to imagine that maybe there is something in the the nature of their day-to-day lives because so much of their life is conducted on horseback that that rhythm, that, you know, that rhythm just gets in their bones. It becomes almost like a heartbeat to them. And just as iambic pentameter, which echoes a heartbeat, that ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum and the the riding of a horse, the ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum of riding a horse also it gets into their bones and it just gets it becomes a rhythm of their life. And then that rhythm works its way out into their poetry. So it's easy to look back on these old poems and think they're just copying an old form. It's um it's kind of it's become a cliche to write in that kind of meter with that rhythm and that rhyme. But um, I wonder if there is something to be said for the fact that, that the very the rhythm of their life is captured by uh, being on a horse and that that comes through in their poetry. And I think a modern equivalent, we don't have, you know, most of us don't have horses these days. The modern equivalent of the horse would be our cars and the stop, start and the traffic lights and the traffic jams. And I wonder if that coincides with the advent of free verse. I wonder if the the stop-start nature of our modern transportation accounts for the stop-start nature of our modern poetry. I don't know. I mean, I am not a scholar, and there is a study in there to be done. If someone can show me the, you know, the graph showing the correlation in, you know, automobiles versus modernist poetry and free verse, I would love to see that mapped, because I think there is something in that. I think I'm a genius, and I've just uncovered the secret of poetry. It's all about transportation. So, um... Which now makes me wonder, what what poetry do you have when you know you're rowing a boat? Is there a particular? Anyway, I digress. So that's something I really I, I love the rhythm in this poem, and it's easy to dismiss the rhythm as a nursery rhyme or you know a very naive folk ballad. But I think the retaining of those elements of people's lives is fascinating, and that's something I've really connected with in the the Australian bush poetry I've been looking at. It's this it's this record, this oral record. Of history and I love it um, so yeah and I think there's I mean it's, it's beautifully written some of the some of the language in this is absolutely wonderful uh, one of the lines that really stood out to me when they're first describing the man from Sto- uh, Snowy River and they say the hills are twice as steep and twice as rough where a horse's hoofs strike firelight from the flint stones every stride the man that holds his own is good enough. That idea of every every time the foot of the the horse hits stone, it sparks fire. I mean, the the vivid imagery in that. This idea that there's almost like a it, it kind of it's got this mechanical, fiery dragon esque power to it, and I think that's amazing. I think that's a really incredible thing to say that. A, a beast of this power is being ridden by this scrawny man from Snowy River, and the fact that he's on a, because he's on one of these mountain horses, we know he's going to be good to the end. Um, so I think there's it's just wonderful language in the poem like that, which I really really enjoy. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this poem, um, if you've particularly enjoyed this poem because of its Australian bush poetry quality then uh, I would recommend that you do actually try and catch me on Periscope. I, I'm not entirely sure how frequent I'm going to be, but if you want to follow me on Twitter and then follow me on Periscope, you should be able to see as I make my way through this um, poetry anthology. Uh, the replays for those can also be found on catch.me uh, forward slash uh, poetry show. So the, the the dynamic of that's a little bit different. If you're not familiar with Periscope, it's me basically doing this but I'm also getting comments in real time live from people who are viewing and I'm trying my best to kind of answer questions and to uh, engage in conversation with them if you're not watching it live it's a little bit of a weird dynamic because you're watching something that was live and you're kind of watching a conversation that had happened so I'm not qu- I'm not quite game enough to put them on this YouTube channel but if you are interested in following that you can check out the catch.me Uh, Or you can catch me live on Periscope and you can engage with me live on the air and I would be happy to talk to you. Uh, If you would prefer to 
engage in a slightly more introverted way, then by all means you can leave me a comment in this YouTube video and I will be very active in the comments, so I'm happy to continue discussions there. If you've enjoyed this series of analysis of poetry, if you've enjoyed uh, learning how to write poems as well, then you can subscribe to this channel or you can check out either of those playlists. And I usually have a little end card over here that says click up here to subscribe and click down here to see one of my other videos. But that takes too long to edit and to compress and I can't be bothered doing that today. So I'm just going to have this kind of weird floating click here and you'll be taken to those places. And they're live annotations within the video so that will work. Anyway, thank you for watching and I really appreciate your company and I will see you next time.